Hi, welcome back. What I want to do in this video is pick up where we left off last time. And where we left off was we had a fatty acid in the cell. So here's the fatty acid, right? And there's some generic R group, right? So I've got this fatty acid inside the cell, but it turns out that I can't just oxidize it already. I have to attach a coenzyme A to it, right? And so what we're going to be talking about in this video is we're going to be talking about an enzyme called fatty acyl coenzyme A synthetase. Fatty acyl coenzyme A synthetase, okay? And this molecule or this reaction is a very important reaction. I'm going to, going to go ahead and draw this because it actually is important to see this. What I'm drawing now is I'm drawing ATP. I'm going to draw ATP. And these phosphates I'm going to abbreviate. And you'll see why in a minute. And then, of course, up here you have your purine, your adenine, right? Oops, that should not be a double bond right there. This should be, actually, yeah, that should be a double bond. Excuse me. There. Okay, so I've got my ATP. And so here's what's going to happen. I have a lone pair. I'll do it in red. I have a lone pair on this oxygen, right? And this lone pair is going to do a nucleophilic attack. And it's specifically going to do a nucleophilic attack on this phosphorus. And what's going to happen is this pi bond is going to kick up. Now, one thing I want to be clear is, in the last video, we looked at a serine hydrolase. And the hydrolysis was occurring on a trigonal planar um, structure. So the intermediate goes up one hybridization. It goes up to tetrahedral. But notice, in this case, we already have four electron domains. So it's already tetrahedral. So the intermediate in a reaction like this is a trigonal bipyramidal intermediate. You don't normally see those unless you're dealing with phosphates or sulfates or arsenates and things like that. Um, usually it's going to be phosphates and sulfates, sometimes selenates. But um, normally it's going to be trigonal planar, or excuse me, a tetrahedral intermediate. This time it's a trigonal bipyramidal. And then ultimately those electrons are going to kick back down and you're going to kick off, you're going to kick off this molecule right here. And this right here, these two phosphates together are called pyrophosphate. And I'm going to draw them down here for now. And we'll come back to them later. But this is pyrophosphate and it's a very important molecule and we'll see why in just a few minutes when we get done with this mechanism up here. But this is pyrophosphate. But anyways, what we end up generating is we generate this. Draw it. So here is the R. I'm switching the direction of how I'm drawing it. So we end up with this. And then I'm going to draw over here. This is adenosine. Adenosine. I'm just going to abbreviate it. Okay, so what have we done? We have activated, we have activated the fatty acid, right? We've attached an AMP to it, right? Adenosine is just adenosine, and then the phosphate makes it AMP. So by attaching an AMP to this, what we've done is we've activated this carbon for nucleophilic attack, and specifically a nucleophilic acyl substitution, right? So we have activated it. And so this is, again, this is still by the same enzyme. This is still fatty acyl coid, uh, fatty, excuse me, fatty acyl coid uh, synth synthetase, not dehydrogenase, synthetase. And essentially what's going to happen now is coenzyme A is going to come in, and I'll do that in green. So here's coenzyme A. Recall that coenzyme A has a lone pair there. And what's going to happen is coenzyme A's thiol lone pair is going to come into a nucleophilic attack and ultimately a nucleophilic acyl substitution and it's going to kick off AMP, right? It's going to kick off AMP. So what do we have left? We have coenzyme A in a thioester bond with the fatty acid. So 
What type of enzyme is this? Well, let's sort of look at it. We're basically, the net effect is combining two different molecules. What are we combining? We're combining coenzyme A and a fatty acid, right? Coenzyme A and a fatty acid. When you, so here's an important distinction that I want to be clear about. Let's talk about transferase versus ligase because they are very similar but very different at the same time. A transferase is an enzyme that transfers a portion of a molecule, not the whole thing. Ligases transfer the whole molecule, maybe with the exception of protons, but generally the whole molecule. In this case, we're transferring an entire CoA, not a portion, but the whole molecule. So this enzyme, uh, fatty acyl CoA synthetase, is a ligase. But we can even break ligases down into two groups. We can break them down into ones that use ATP and ones that don't use ATP, no ATP. And it turns out that the ones that don't use ATP are just ligases. We just call them ligases. But the ones that, that use ATP have a special name. And, and, and really, in general, they, they can be, it can use ATP, it can use GTP, although usually it is ATP. And they have a special name, and they're called synthetases. Synthetase. You already seen a synthetase, and that was that was this. You saw a synthetase, and that reaction was this. It was um, the synthetase was this reaction, right? Right. What is this enzyme? Well. It's succinyl coenzyme A synthetase. Well, it may not not make it might not make a lot of sense because remember in this direction I'm going from GDP to GTP, but the reaction is actually named for the reverse reaction. And I want to just and I, I I already mentioned this in the TCA cycle video, but it's kind of stupid that it's named for the reverse reaction, right? Because under physiological conditions, this reaction never reverses. It goes in the direction that creates GTP. But in the reverse direction, it is a synthetase. But anyways, uh, ligases that use ATP are called synthetases. So this particular enzyme is fatty acyl co coenzyme A synthetase. You could also call it fatty acid CoA ligase. That would be another name for it. Um, but ultimately, it's going to uh, use ATP, and therefore it's a synthetase. Now, one thing I want to I want to mention is that in this process, notice this. We generated this, and I drew it down here in its full structure. It's pyrophosphate. Pyrophosphate. A pyrophosphate is essentially just two phosphates bound together in a phosphodiester bond. All right, that's what this is. There's another enzyme that's at play here, and this enzyme is called inorganic. Inorganic because there's no carbon. Inorganic pyrophosphatase. And the mechanism is actually fairly simple. So here's a water. Put the lone pair. And it's going to do a nucleophilic acyl substitution. Pi bond kicks up, kicks back down. And this is the leaving group right there. So ultimately, what you generate are two inorganic phosphates. Now, why is this important in this reaction? Well, and actually th this number I'm getting out of Leninger 6th edition, the delta G of this particular reaction, just the inorganic pyrophosphatase, the delta G standard is negative 19, negative 19 kilojoules per mole. So why is that important? Well, recall that negative delta G's signify a spontaneous reaction. So if you, are add, if you are adding negativity to the overall delta G, which includes the synthetase, right? If you're increasing the negativity, you're increasing the spontaneity of the reaction. So when you do fatty acyl coenzyme A synthetase, there's gonna be a corresponding inorganic pyrophosphatase nearby 
to hydrolyze the pyrophosphate and drive the reaction forward. And actually what you'll find in many reactions, especially in biochem 2, um, and, uh, um, there are a lot of pyrophosphate generating reactions. In fact, in fact, one of them is DNA polymerase. In fact, RNA polymerase is as well. And so is reverse transcriptase. So all, all the polymerases are pyrophosphate generating reactions. And I could be wrong, and don't quote me on this, but I believe, believe the ribosome is as well. Um, or, at le or at least amino acid activation is. But they all generate pyrophosphate. So there's going to be a corresponding pyrophosphatase nearby that drives the reaction forward. And it drives the reaction by releasing free energy. And remember, when you release free energy, that's a negative change in free energy. And so negative free energy changes correspond to spontaneous reactions. So what you're doing with this is increasing the overall spontaneity of the reaction. So it helps to drive the reaction forward. And in fact, the DNA polymerases that do this, um, like I mentioned, they generate pyrophosphate. And part of the driving force for the synthesis of DNA and also the synthesis of RNA is the pyrophosphatase. So this is a very important enzyme, especially when you're talking about spontaneity and Gibbs free energy and all that. But if we regroup, we had fatty acyl coenzyme A synthetase. We first activated the fatty acid by attaching an AMP to it, right? There's the adenosine, the phosphate, and the fatty acid. And then we thiolize it. A thiol, the thiol of the coenzyme A does a nucleophilic acyl substitution, and we end up with our final product, this guy. And what we'll find is that this guy right here can go into beta oxidation. And actually, one thing I want to make clear is that this R group could be saturated or unsaturated. I'm not designating whether it's saturated or unsaturated. It could, for all we know, it could be either one. And in fact, triacylglycerols can have, right, they have three fatty acids. One of them could be saturated, two could be unsaturated, or you know, two could be saturated, one could be unsaturated. It could be a mix of a whole bunch of things. So I'm not designating which one it is here. But just know that this particular molecule, this fatty acid with the activation CoA on it, can go into beta oxidation. And in the next video, we're actually going to look at saturated fatty acid beta oxidation. Later on, we'll go into unsaturated beta oxidation. So I hope this video helps. See you in the next video.